Good morning. Let's go and stand up together this morning.
Good morning. Man, what an awesome way to start the service. I just want to give it up for our worship team because they show up so early and they're, oh man, they're killing it. Hey, you guys can have a seat. We're so glad you're here. If you are turning in, tuning in online on Facebook Live, we are so glad you're here as well. What an honor and a privilege to be worshiping with you in the comfort of your home and that we're able to connect. So, so awesome. Thanks for being here, guys. I just have to say this. I am proud of us uh, you know, this has been a long, laborious se- season of uncertainty and frustration, and you guys have been wonderful in wearing masks. And I just want to say thank you for doing that because it's one of the ways that we show that we love our fellow humans. So give yourselves a hand for doing that. I know, I know, it's tough. It's tough, but we will get through this. And uh, just uh, another round of applause for Rob Roy. He's married. He's married. He's here. He's all hitched. Come on. There he is. There's this glow about you this morning. I don't know. I don't know. But yes, we're, we're glad you're back this week. So a uh, couple cool things going on here this week and this next few weeks at Next Chapter. I love this resource. If you have not tuned in, especially if you're watching online right now media how many of you have used right now media in your homes or in your life groups or small groups okay amazing resource it's completely free and uh, thousands and thousands of video driven bible studies that you can use uh, for small groups life groups zoom meetings or your own personal devotional time it is killer and every week we also post a right now media highlight on our Facebook page and through the weekly updates so you can see just a recommendation of something you can use in your personal devotional walk. So if that's something you don't have and you want, you can put in the comments your email. I'll send you a link or you can connect with me or Rob or email office at the Next Chapter Church and we'll send you a link so you can access thousands of videos for free. So it's a really great thing kind of when you're feeling isolated that you can still uh, move closer to Christ on your laptop or your cell phone. So uh, this is happening. The gift card drive is starting today. We forgot to put the basket out. It's supposed to be right here. So um, right here at this part of the stage on the carpet, we're going to have, uh, oh, Rob's grabbing it. He's grabbing it. Okay. Uh, we're going to have a basket here. So at any point during the service, post-service, pre-service, feel fee- free to drop in a gift card of any denomination for any retailer or store or restaurant. This is something that we use as a practical way to be the hands and feet of Jesus throughout the entire year as needs arise in our congregation and outside of our congregation. We use these as practical gifts for people. So you can drop it in five bucks, 10 bucks, hundred dollars, whatever fits your budget. It's just a great way to give. So um, speaking of giving, one of the ways that we worship is through our, our resources. So um, we're going to go and pray and we're going to continue through the service and uh, just invite the Holy Spirit to have his way in our hearts. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you for your presence and your pursuit of us, the way you pursue us, your children. We thank you for the open invitation that you've provided for us to be in your presence, your open arms as a loving father. And we ask this morning that um, in fresh new ways as we sing songs and we learn about you through scripture and through message that you reveal more of your love and more of your grace. And you would also kind of beckon and encourage us to look more like your son Jesus. And whether that is through our words, our actions, or our resources, we ask that you would help us to take whatever next beautiful step it is to look more like your son Jesus. We ask this in his name. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand up together. I search the world It couldn't fail Praise and treasures of faith are never enough. Then you came along and you put me back together. 
Father, that is our prayer that wherever we are trying to build kingdoms or things or foundations or places of peace on ground that isn't solid, that is shaky, we ask that you'd help us to focus our attention on the consistency of your love, to lean on it and to display it to others. That is our prayer. As challenging as it is, mold our hearts to look more like your son, Jesus. We ask this in his name. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Good morning. Good to see you this morning. And uh, uh, I'll say a personal word and then I'll share some thoughts while we're worshiping. Um, yes, thank you. So I got married uh, not that it's about me, but I got married last Saturday, so it's been one week, and it has been a great one week of marriage. <laughs> There's not been one fight yet in this first week. It's been great, um, but I'm so thankful. Thank you all, uh, really, truly. Thank you for being excited for us, and uh, I don't know why that made me cry, and supportive of us, and um, wishing the best for us. I, I appreciate that. It means a lot, and you know, when you go around marriage a second time, you have to really want to do it because you know what it's like the first time and you know the good and the bad. And, uh, and I'm so thankful. We both very much wanted to be in this marriage. And um, it has been a, it's really a, it's, it's really a blessing of experiencing God's restoration in our lives. And it's come at, um, you know, waiting around nine, 10 years since I was divorced last. And you know what, when you go through divorces, they're so painful, but you wonder, wonder when I'll get married again. I knew in my heart I wanted to be married again, but I knew in my heart too, I wasn't gonna settle. And, I, and if it didn't happen, then I was okay too. Um, but I thought, well, because I wanna get married, it'll probably be, you know, five years or so. I didn't think it'd be 10 years or nine, nine or 10 years. And yet I'm so thankful for God's timing in these nine and 10 years, because he's helped show me a lot. He's helped bring a lot of healing to me. He's helped me to kind of grow where I needed to be to be in this marriage. And so, um, yeah, but it was always, as we were singing, this is what I wanted to get to too. It was always been an exercise of trust in God. It's always been an exercise in faith. And whether it's a marriage or a second marriage or a first marriage or a fourth marriage, um, it doesn't really matter. We all are experiencing in our lives um, exercises of faith where we have to trust God. And um, it's easy to doubt. It's easy to question. And uh, we had Kathy Clare's funeral here this week who passed away, Kate Drews's daughter. And it was a beautiful service, beautiful celebration. And one of the things as I was speaking and thinking, it, it really did hit me. Um, and all of our questions and doubt and all of our wonders and all of our um, doubting of God and his timing and how long things are taking and why aren't things playing out the way that I thought they would play out? It's all a trust thing. It's all a trust game. And I imagine God saying, just hang in there and trust me. I know you, don't, I know you don't know when it's gonna happen. I know you don't know how it's gonna happen, but just trust me. I'm taking you someplace great and I'm gonna be with you every step of the way. And so while we were singing, I will build my trust on you. It's a firm foundation. It's tough to trust God at times. And I don't know if that speaks to any of us in here this morning or anybody that's watching on Facebook or that are home watching it. Um, but I just got the sense of that may we just hear God say, just hang on and trust me. Hang on and trust me. And it's hard to do, but I'm experiencing those, that fruit in my life. I know you've experienced that trusting in God's time in your life too. So may we just continue to do that. This morning, really, in my message, here's my agenda. I like when pastors sometimes say, here's what I want, here's my agenda in today. Here's my agenda. My agenda is simply that you would hear God tell you who he says that you are. And we would take away every other voice that competes with that. That you would just hear who God says that you are to him and that it would help you to either know him for the first time or continue to grow in your relationship with God, because that's ultimately what we're here about. So let's pray together, and then we'll continue on. God, thank you. Um, thank you for being such a loving God 
Thank you for being such a God that is patient with me and with us. And you know that faith isn't easy. We are, we are definitely people that like to see things as opposed to just have faith in them. So may you give us extra faith today. Help us to see things that we've not seen in a long time or we've never seen before. And so God, I pray that your spirit would be here and be very evident among us and that you would uh, just have your way in this place today. And God, I pray that as we leave, we will be encouraged because we have, will have experienced you in some way today. I pray for everyone who's hurting today. I pray for everyone who has loss. I pray for everyone um, who wants to give up. I pray for everyone um, who feels lonely. I pray for everyone who's depressed, for whoever's experiencing anxiety. Uh, pray for those who are hopeless today. God, would you infuse them? We believe you are the great power, the great creator God. And so would you meet us where we are today and infuse them with exactly what they need? We ask this in the most powerful name we have, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the one who saved our souls. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brent. You all did sound great today. I'm glad you already gave it up for the band. <laughs> Great job. I heard Kevin Johnson did a great job last week. That big, dark brown, sweet chocolate guy. He is such a good guy. Uh, he's such a good friend me, of me personally and someone in the ministry that I can really just connect with. And uh, I haven't listened. Jennifer and I are going to listen to, maybe we'll do it today. We want to listen to his message last week. But I heard so many positive things. And I love hearing that. I love hearing that. And Kevin is a great job, great man. So, um, so, Kevin, I don't know if you're listening. I heard he gave me a few shout-outs last week. But, Kevin, if you're listening, thank you, buddy. I love you, and we appreciate you here at Next Chapter. And I love that relationship that we have with him, and that continues to form. So I appreciate him filling in. Now you get the white version of Kevin Johnson. We, we, both, we jokingly say, like, we're, we're the same. He's just black, and I'm white. But we're kind of like the same personality. Um, but we're finishing up this last sermon of the Declutter series. And really the whole intention of the series is that we would learn to declutter the stuff that's in our spirit and in our heart that keeps us from knowing God and getting closer to God and simplifying our life and experiencing life more full. So there's lots of things that clutter our spirits and clutter our hearts. And today we're going to look at how, do, I've heard people say, um, when they have quiet times in the mornings, when they pray with God or read scripture or read a devotional, it kind of helps center their, their spirit. And I want to look at how do we center our spirit so that we can experience the peace and the joy and the love that God offers. And, it, and it's in the center that we experience that. And, it, and it's when we get away from all of the chaos and clutter that we can get to the center. At the end, we're going to look at a picture of a hurricane. Think of the, excuse me, the eye of a hurricane. When there's chaos and winds and death and pressure all around us. And that eye of the hurricane is supposed to be the most peaceful of all peace. And that eye of the hurricane. And that's where we want to get. We want to get into the eye. We want to get into the center with God. And so we're going to look at a passage um, that's really, really significant. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Are you with me out there? All right, I can't tell. Your mask makes you all look sleepy. I know that's not the case. <laughs> But it is funny, all I can see is your eyes, and some of them look like mine, they look real tired. Um, all right, Hebrews 4, 12, the writer of Hebrews says this, For the word of God, which is the scriptures, which is anytime God speaks to us, which is when God speaks to, to you through someone else, the word of God, it is alive and it is active. That's what makes it so powerful. You can read the same verse a hundred times, and depending on where you are in your life, you can get a hundred different meanings of it because it's alive and it's active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword, which is an interesting analogy. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Now, it's interesting it divides and it penetrates. It's a sword and it divides between soul and spirit. And he gives us some parallels of what spirit, soul and spirit is, joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. When we think, usually when we think of human beings, we think of just body and spirit. But the Bible talks a lot about some other meanings of it. And this is one passage that it's important to dig deeper to understand, well, what is, what's the difference in soul and spirit? We think it's body and spirit, but there's a soul and spirit. And it says the word of God is able to penetrate and divide the soul and spirit. So what is the author talking about? 
Well, we know what joints are. Many, as you get older, they start hurting, don't they, Keith? They start wearing out and hurting. Um, but we know that joints, joints hold all the bones together. So joints are the thing in our body, hold the skeletal system together. But we also know that marrow is what makes a bone a bone. It is the inside, it's the essence of a bone. It's what makes a bone a bone. The joint holds it all together, but the marrow is what makes the, the marrow is the essence of the bone while the joint holds it, holds it together. So the soul, or where we get the word psychology is the, the, re, the Greek word for soul. I think it's suke. It is what holds you together. Kind of like joints hold a bone together. Our soul is what holds us together. And so mostly, when you think of a soul, think of your mind. It's the thinking center. Um, it's all that we think. It's the memories. It's future dreams. It's how you experience and think of yourself. That's our soul. And he says that it can divide and penetrate the soul and spirit. So the spirit is something much more critical and important. The spirit is something way more profound. The spirit is like the marrow of the bone. The spirit is the essence of who I am. It is the core of who I am. It's the center of my being. So he says, the soul is to the spirit what joints are to marrow. And what thoughts are to your intentions. The attitudes of your heart. Whatever's in your heart, that's what you think about. So your thoughts hold whatever the essence of your heart is. Joints hold the essence of bones. Our spirit, our soul holds the essence of our soul. And so the word of God is able to separate those two things. The soul and our spirit, it can separate those things. So here's God's design. This is why it's important to distinguish between the soul and the spirit. This is God's design between the soul and the spirit. And I'm going to use my handy dandy whiteboard over here. And I'll do this way, and hopefully you can see it there on the camera, Paul. Paul, you're going to be doing some fancy navigating over there today. Um, so here is God's design of when we look at the distinction between soul and spirit. Think of this. When God created all things, God has always wanted to be the Lord over everything. We know that. God wants to be the Lord over everything. So we have God. I'm going to try to write big, too. We have God. God wants to be the Lord over everything. And then we have spirit. God wants to be Lord over our spirit. The spirit is the essence of who we are. It is the core of who we are. It's the marrow to the bone. Um, it's the spirit. God wants us to be Lord over the spirit so that he can then define and tell you and tell me who I really am inside, deep inside. So if he's Lord over the spirit, then he can be Lord over my soul, which then because of what he says that I am and who I am, then my soul will begin to think on that way. It will begin to think that way. And my soul will know, oh, well, I'm a child of God. I am a beloved son and daughter of God. That's who I am. So then that's how I think. That's what will hold. That's what will be in this container that holds what really is going on. And then from the soul, it will be our body. Oh, I should have done this a little bit further over here. will be our body. So whatever we think, you know what happens is it outplays in our body. So if you don't have very much self-confidence, you know how people walk around on much self-confidence. They kind of look around like this and like that. Your body will portray whatever is in your soul, and then whatever's in your body will come out to the world. So here's the beautiful part. When all this is in sync and when all this, can you all see over there? <laughs> Kathy, you all can't see. Oh, hang on. Let me see that. Yeah, It's really important. It's really good handwriting. So when all this is in sync, I don't have good handwriting. I'm just kidding. When all this is in sync, God is informing my spirit, informing your spirit of who you are at the core of your being. Then that informs your mind of what to think. Oh, yes, that's who I am, which then plays out in the body. And God has always used agents or mediators to accomplish his will. And we are his mediators. And when we're in line with that, we play this out in the world. And guess what? God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. That's God's design. Now, the problem is, like so much of our world, Satan has come in and messed up with his hierarchy and has just, just messed it up. Um, I'll try to put it on this. I, was, I meant to do more of a V, but we'll go with this anyway. It might just be smaller. 
Um, so we'll use red for Satan because, you know, he's just red. It has a pitchfork and horns and stuff. And so, uh, I'm just kidding, he doesn't. So the hierarchy is this, but Satan's coming like he does with everything. Satan perverts everything. Everything good that God created, Satan will pervert. Sex is good, but the enemy will come and pervert it. Um, relationships are good, but the enemy will come and pervert it. Uh, technology is fine, but the enemy will come in and pervert it. And so to pervert means to uh, reverse in the opposite direction. That's what it means. So the enemy comes and says, no, 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 this isn't how it works. The way it works is he uses the world, he uses the world to inform and to impact your body. But then he comes over here, and it's going to go the in complete opposite way, but we feel this, we know this. So the way that works, the world, someone, your uncle, your aunt, your mom, your dad says, you're ugly. You're just a bad kid. You're never going to amount to anything. Why are you fat? The world will tell us things, and I'll receive it through my body. And then it comes up to my soul, which is my thinking system, and I think, oh, well, I must be ugly. I must be fat. I must not amount to anything. And then it goes up to my spirit, which instead of God informing my spirit, this is informing my spirit. and says, well, that, that's just who I am. I'm, I'm just never going to make it. It's just who I am. And you play these tapes over and over and over in our minds. And the problem is this is God's design. This is Satan's design. And here is the battle. And you've heard of this because there's books written about this. Here is the battle. I'll get that later. The battle is in the soul, which again is what? It's, it's the mind. It's the thinking. So the battle is here. The problem is, and what I want us to get us to look at this morning, is who is informing our soul? Because whoever is informing our soul is the Lord of our life. And God is saying, I, I want to be the Lord of your life. I want to tell you who you are. And if you're not listening to me, you're listening to the enemy, and he will always pervert it. He will always reverse things. God wants this, it's, it's a, it's a top-down, an inside-out flow, and Satan's design is bottom-up, and it's an outside-in, where outside forces dictate who you are. And God said, no, I'm going to dictate who you are and then play that out into the world. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Um, and so, as I, as I mentioned we often will inherit self and identities from our environment. That's how Satan's design works. But when we surrender to Jesus, and this is the beauty of the good news, like when we surrender to Jesus, the Bible says that we become a new creature. We become a new creation. We are children of God. We have a new identity. We have a new destiny. But the problem is our soul, our mind isn't automatically healed. That's where we've got to catch up sometimes. Um, and we don't automatically, as Christians, go to some fantasy world where, where evil never hits us anymore. That doesn't have, that's not life. And so God tells you who you are, but there are all these other forces telling you who you are and the world telling you who you are. And so this battle goes on. But our job as kingdom people is, is to tell our brains what to think. And through the Holy Spirit, we have the power to tell our brains what what to think. This is why the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It can divide, it can penetrate between the soul and the mind, and, it, and we, He does that. We do that through, through meditating and saturating ourselves in the truth of God, the Word of God, because it penetrates between what's here and what's here. Whatever doesn't agree with the Word is not true, and it can cut and divide the lie from the truth. And so whatever was said to you, the word of God could come in and say, Chris, that's not true, and can penetrate you, do surgery on you. And say, nope, that's a lie. Don't think that way. I'm going to tell you what's true. And maybe you felt like you're a victim all your life, but the truth of God can penetrate your soul and spirit and say, no, you can do all things through Christ. Maybe you thought you just have to achieve and acquire stuff to have worth, but the the, the word of God is sharp and it can penetrate that. Or you were told you were ugly, but the, the, the word of God can penetrate that. Said, no, no, you're the radiant bride of Christ. That's who you are. 
That's why the Bible is so emphatic of being a disciple of your brain, of your soul. Look in a few verses. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says this. Paul says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You are a spirit being, and you have authority to do that. I have authority to do that. And then Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 through 24, Paul says this. Um, That, however, is talking about the fleshly way to live. That, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ, you were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self. Created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You already have it. You already have it there. The the truth is already there. It's just letting our brains catch up to what's already in our spirit. And then Paul says in Philippians chapter 4 verse 8. He says, finally brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. Meditate on those things. Meditate on those things. If we do not think about what's true and noble, we will have an ugly and dishonorable life. But we do have the power to tell our brains what to think. So that's why it's so important to saturate our minds with the truth of God. This is what's helped me in my life. I have to constantly be thinking about the truth of God, of who God says that I am. That's the only way that I've made it to the point where I am. I have to saturate my mind with the truth of God. Most people think what they think is just normal. That's just the way it is. I'm a loser. That's just what I've always thought. That's just the way it is. And you will live as if that's true because someone has downloaded a self, a false self in you. It's a false self. Anything that's not lovely and noble and pure, it's not what God says who you are. And unless you, your spirit being realizes you are more than that, You'll keep feeling and thinking the things you've always felt and thought. God will tell you who you really are. So that's kind of the theology piece of this. Now I'm going to get to the practical piece. It's like a, uh, uh, think of (laughs) when I was a kid, actually when I was growing up, we lived in Latonia for a little bit. Uh, My second and third grade year, I went to Latonia Elementary. And there used to be on the playground this thing called the bell. And you would, you, you would get on it and you would hang on it. Now they would never have this in the playground. <laughs> you would hang on it and you would get to spinning. And that thing would start spinning you and spinning you. And you would kind of go up and down, up and down. And um, I remember one time we got it going so fast, it scared me. And I, I, there's no other way to get off other than you just got to jump off or it throws you off. And um, I just had to let go and it threw me off. But that thing was fun and scary all at the same time. Or think of a merry-go-round as you're a little kid. When you get going and it's going and going and going, when you're on the outside, it's really fast. But the way to solve that is if you were to get into the inside of a merry-go-round, it's not near as fast. That centrifugal force, when you get on the inside, it's not nearly as fast. And I want us to think of that when we're thinking of decluttering our spirits so that we can hear what God is saying so that the enemy is not telling us who we are and defining who we are. Think of life a lot of times as like a merry-go-round. It's just spinning, 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 spinning. And you know where we are? We're like the tilt the world. Remember the tilt the world? <laughs> we're just on the edge going, oh, and you can't get up, you can't move because of the force. We're like in this world that, that's just spinning out of control and there's death everywhere and there's hate everywhere and there are wars everywhere and it's just spinning, spinning, spinning. And we feel it all. We feel all of that. And the, the idea of what God wants us to say, hey, if you'll get into the center, You don't have to live life on the perimeter because that's where life is so chaotic. So where do you live? Do you live in the center or do you live out on the perimeter because the world is spinning and our bodies and our souls, our minds, if we're not careful, we'll let all of that stuff define who we are. And the enemy would love to take all of that busyness that's swirling around and keep, keep us out of the center. So what's going on in your mind? Are we being disciples of our mind? Or will you let the spin occupy you 24-7? I got to get up. Got to get the kids to school. Got to go to work. 
Got to make dinner. Got to clean up. All the toilets leaking. All the cars broken. Oh, the garage needs cleaning. And it just goes on and on and on and on. Where do we live in this? Is, is our mind being defined by the busyness, by all those things? Or will we remember that we are children of God? That you belong to God? And that you are called to live in a different way? And you are going to live forever? And yes, you may be dad, but you're more than that. You might be mom, but you're more than that. You might be a student, but you're more than that. Your essence is a kingdom person in that center where the peace is. You're a kingdom person. The problem is not that the world keeps spinning because the world's going to keep spinning. The problem is we live outside on the perimeter instead of the center. That's the problem. And that spin zone, it always feels You get the feeling of force and pressure and anxiety and we can get nauseated. We can keep us from sleeping. We get anxious. We get depressed. But if we can find that center, the center is where God is. And he longs for us to visit there. The good news is this, and then we'll wrap up. The good news is this, is that God lives in your center in that center, God lives in that, in that spirit, the center of your being, the core of your being. If you have accepted Jesus into your life, God Almighty lives in the center in your spirit. Look what Paul says in Romans 8, chapter, chapter 8, verse 9. You, how, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. If the spirit of God lives in you, God himself dwells in you. You are the temple of God. You have access to a God habitation zone where the power of God lies in you and lies in me. And it just doesn't lie there. He actually unites himself with you and with me. Look up for This will be a kind of bizarre passage. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. He's trying to explain why the Christians should, why they should not be going to prostitutes, which is a good thing to, to be against. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. So what the Bible knows is, that's why it's talking about, don't get into this premarital sex and all this other stuff, because once you do it, unites what you become one flesh. There's something significant that happens, and the more you unite with other people, it tears it down. And so he says, just like a husband and wife, you become one. When God is in there, in the center, in your spirit, You become one with God. God unites himself with you. And God unites his peace with you. God unites his joy with you. God unites his love with you. And maybe you're going through a divorce. Maybe you're going through a hard time. Maybe you are foreclosing on your home. I don't know what it may be during this COVID season. But you are united with God. And you have this center God zone in your life. The question is, will you benefit from that? Benefit from that or not benefit from it? Because God is united to you right now. And it's not even if you get your act together. He's there. And sometimes we chase God all over the place, all over the different cities and different countries, but God is living in us. We have God in us now. And do you realize you have God in your life to empower you, not to get your act together, but that you might benefit from his peace and love and joy? The band can come on up. If our brains are occupied with busyness 24-7, that's what you will experience. That's what I will experience. If I'm in this spin zone 24-7, I will experience a life that is not simplified, that is not uncluttered. It will be so cluttered, I can't experience the God zone of my life. I want you to take a look. I told you earlier, this is a picture of a hurricane. Not that you need to know what a picture of a hurricane is. But look from this topical picture here. I want you to look at it for a second, and then I want, with music playing, and when they get ready, I want us to have another little just time with God, just a a quiet prayer time. Um, Picture this, as I mentioned, the world as a hurricane spinning around us. All the stuff, all the stuff, negative, positive, but all the stuff going around her around us and in the center is where it's supposed to be the most peaceful peaceful of peaceful places and our spirit is that center if you have accepted Jesus 
He is in that center. He's in that, he's in that the center in our spirit. And he says, I want to define you. I want to let you know how worth, how much you mean to me. I want you to know who you are so you can live from that. But I'm telling you right now, you can have God in your spirit, but if you're living from the spin zone and letting it do this, you'll still be a Christian, but you will miss out from the peace and the love and the joy that comes from this center of being with God. So would you close your eyes or whatever you need to do to bow your heads? I'm going to set this down here as I do that. All right, we're just going to let that fall over. <laughs> close your eyes real quick. And Brent's going to play, and then um, we'll go into this song. If you'll just listen to it for a few minutes, and then Brent will invite us in to sing with it. But remember, here's what I want you to do. As you think of the center of the hurricane, I want you to really, truly imagine yourself, however you do this, imagine yourself getting through the center of the hurricane, and now you're on ground level, and you're in the center of the hurricane, and that cyclone is the chaos of your life, but you're in the, in the center, and it's spinning all around you. It might be destructive, but you're in the center. Just look at the chaos all around you, and remember this morning that God is, is with you in that center. That God is there. God, help us to see you and experience you right now. Try to see Jesus in the center of that hurricane with you. Imagine Jesus holding you in the center right now with all that's going on around you in life. Sense his warmth, sense his love. May you hear something this morning. And in that center, he's saying, surrender the chaos to me. I am here and I'm not going away. God says this morning, I will give you peace, a perfect peace. If you keep your mind on it. I love being with you in this place. I love sharing my joy. And hear God saying, trust me, it will be okay. Surrender to me. I hear God say this at times, and I want you to hear him say, I love when you come off from the perimeter and come to the center place. I love, Rob, when you visit me often here. Just know I never go away. You can always turn here and believe when I say what I say about you. So God, may we just listen as the music plays and the band sings. May we just listen for your still small voice. Would you help us just to be in the center with you this morning and speak to us. Let us know who you say we are.
who I am. Don't you ever forget it. And uh, I pray as we go this week, we truly would live from that center place, that we would spend time this, this week just to be still with God so he can inform who we are and not let that perverted enemy, Satan, mess with us any longer. Let's pray together and know that you are loved uh, by me, but more importantly, by God. God, thank you um, for always being with us. You never, you never leave us. We don't always come visit. We don't always come to you and we can leave you, but you never leave us. So thank you, God. I pray more than anything today you would empower us to be disciples of our brain, that you would help us um, to know who we are at all times. Father, thank you for what you're doing in all of our lives here in this room. Thank you for what you're going to continue to do through this local community called Next Chapter Church. And we will give you all the credit and the glory for what you do. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. And everybody said, amen. Have a great day.